today is really about where the World Wide Web has come from. It's hard to think of any invention since possibly the printing press that's actually had this sort of um, level of impact and influence. But it didn't spring into being fully formed. It was really a very, very simple implementation of the vision that had been around for decades. So simple, in fact, that when the, um, the World Wide Web's first outing was a paper that was written and sent to the ACM's annual Hypertext conference, and it was rejected on the grounds that something that simple surely couldn't be considered to be Hypertext. It was just a set of um, documents and, and pointers. The roots of the World Wide Web really go back a very long time and before modern digital computers even. Um, back in the um, early part of the 20th century, there was a scientist and engineer called Vannevar Bush, who was an American scientist. He made his name working on mechanical calculating machines. Um, and he rose to be tremendously eminent. And during the Second World War, he became the director of the Office of Re Scientific Research and Development, um, who was essentially the manager of all of the American government's research projects. That included the nuclear bomb project and many, many others. He was really the first scientist to get to grips with a big modern bureaucracy. And of course, what he found was vast amounts of information flying around all over the place, far more than any one person can keep in their heads. And he looked upon that as a scientist, as a problem to be solved. And in, in 1945, in the, in the last few months of the war, he wrote, an extraordinarily influential paper that he called As We May Think, that was published in the Atlantic Monthly. In it, he addressed this issue of information and knowledge, but thinking, could we use machines to manage that? And he speculated about a possible machine that he called a memex, a memory extender, which was basically an automated microfilm reader, and it was intended for scientists um, to use. He said in the paper that maybe um, one day every scientist could have one of these machines um, on their desk, and it would contain all the scientific literature published, I mean, everything. That's the idea of, of this. He then started thinking about how you organise all of the scientific literature ever published. And he started designing um, systems of links and trails and guides and such like. And although the Memex was never built, I mean, this uh, was never something that became real, the thinking behind it, that machines could be used to do this, was fantastically influential. Some Decades later, in the 1960s, computers started to become mature enough to potentially be able to do this sort of thing. And a number of really important pioneers of computing started thinking about this. They were well aware of Vannevar Bush's work. There was somebody called Douglas Engelbart. Douglas Engelbart lays a very great claim to having invented our world. He invented the mouse, windowed user interfaces, word processing, email. He was the recipient of the very first email, video conferencing. The list just goes on and on and on, but maybe that could be another video. But he was at Stanford being funded by the government but when they, his funding um, came to an end, Xerox headhunted a lot of his team. And so a lot of Douglas Engelbart's research team wound up in Xerox Park, creating all the things that they created there. In any case, um, Douglas Engelbart uh, was very much influenced by Vannevar Bush, and he speculated that you could design computer software that were what he called augmentation systems. And an augmentation system is something that augments human intellect. Basically, it makes people smarter people. It makes people better at doing the things that, that they do. 
And at the same sort of time, from a very different background, um, there was somebody called Ted Nelson. Ted Nelson was a writer, really, primarily a writer. He came out of the world of movies. His mother was an Oscar-winning actress. His father was an um, award-winning television director. And Ted was looking at this technology and Vannevar Bush's um, thinking um, to see how this could be used for literature and for literary purposes. And one of his really important books that he wrote was in fact called Literary Machines. And Ted Nelson invented the word hypertext and he designed back in the 1960s systems that in many ways have inspired modern hypertext systems and the World Wide Web. Um, his grand design was something that he called Project Xanadu, which was a software system that was never really finished in those days. It's been worked on since, and to some extent, Ted Nelson is still working on it to this day. The idea of Project Xanadu, again, as with Memex, it could store all of the world's um, writings and literature. And it would do that in distributed servers. So it wouldn't put it all in one place, but there would be servers scattered all over the world that would communicate over networks. And all of the material, the content would be available and people could create new material and new content by quoting original sources and taking the original material and putting it into a new context. But an interesting part of this is Ted also envisaged a microcharging um, system so that the original content creators would actually get um, revenue from their material being quoted and put into new um, contexts. And there was also a layer of linking. So as well as the, the, the mechanisms of quotations, you can link from one thing to something else which is relevant to something else. Xanadu was a fantastically complex and visionary design and it influenced a whole generation of computer scientists who were thinking about um, these sorts of things. And then in the 1980s and up, and up through the early 1990s, there were a number of hypertext systems developed, mostly in universities, so some became commercial products. There was a rather wonderful system called Guide. Guide um, was, it wasn't distributed, it didn't communicate on networks, but you would create a document, a bit like an MS Office document, but it was a document designed to be delivered on a computer full of links and um, different ways of presenting in, in, in information. Um, and Guide was for what it was developed in the University of Kent, but it um, for a while was a commercial product. And it was used for doing things like developing online manuals and training material and such like. Um, there was another system called Microcosm, which was developed in the University of Southampton. Now, this took the ideas of Ted Nelson and Douglas Engelbart, but it embedded them, rather than in a piece of software, it embedded them in the operating system. So it, your entire operating system would become a hypermedia system. And uh, by the time that Microcosm was around, there was such a thing as Windows, and you would install Microcosm onto your computer, and it would give Windows itself all of this extra hypertext um, functionality of linking and, um, and various um, sorts of things. All of the software on your computer would then become a viewer into this Microcosm world. Again, at this sort of time, in the um, um, early 90s, um, the story, which I'm sure most people are aware of, is Tim Berners-Lee and also a colleague of his, Robert Kailiou, um, were working in CERN, um, the particle physics labs in Geneva, um, and they were interested in using this sort of approach, the whole ideas of hypertext, to help scientists share papers that they were working on. That was the original intention of it. And, of course, their project was the World Wide Web, and that has change the world spectacularly. But the really interesting thing is why. Because the web wasn't the first hypertext system, as you said, it had been around for many, many years. It wasn't um, particularly innovative. It wasn't the best system in that it had less functionality than many of these other systems. The stroke of genius, and it's the genius that really has changed the world, is not in what it was, but 
how it was utilised, because all of these other systems were heavily protected. When there were research projects, if you wanted to use them, you had to be a research collaborator and go and sign non-disclosure agreements um, and get involved in the research. If they were commercial products, they were often quite expensive. You need to pay a lot of money to use these things. Whereas the attitude of Tim Berners-Lee and what really created the web, far more than anything technical, was um, this is simple, this is free, anybody can do anything they like with it. And very quickly, people wrote um, better web servers than the original web servers and better web browsers than the original web browsers and started adding features to it. The very first incarnations of the web are very simple by modern standards. They added um, graphics, added all sorts of other facilities. And it was that making it open to the world, throwing it open to the world of geeks, that is what has changed the world more than anything technical. It's very difficult for a firewall or something to notice this because these are valid HTTP requests. They're just super slow, right? And, um, you know, maybe I've just got a really bad internet connection, maybe. Yeah. Um, now, this doesn't affect every web server. It mostly affects Apache.